One of the winners of our last Chess Kid site-wide contest was Sour Hatch. That's right, the Sour Hatch Kid. Got to play Fun Master Mike, and he gets his game reviewed today. He played E4. Fun Master Mike was black and played G6. This is called a hypo-modern opening. In fact, it's just called the modern opening, so hopefully I didn't confuse you there. All right, not bad. Why not take control of the center? Yeah, snow plow already. Bishop to G7, attacking those dark squares. C3, okay, not the most common move, but certainly very solid. I can't fault it preparing for any possible pressure on the d4 pawn. After all, in the modern, black usually plays for e5 or c5, so white's just getting ready for that. Okay, I played d6, and now I had a bit of a wall being formed. We have to move f3. Now, we do have a chess kid video about fortresses, although I don't think you need to make a fortress on the fourth move of the game. I like the prettiness of this wall, but sometimes pretty doesn't equal chess fundamentally sound. This opens up this diagonal to the king and further weakens the dark squares. There's no way to give immediate checkmate or anything. It's just I think white needs to start focusing on getting those back row pieces developed. Okay. So I played e5 right away, and I'm already thinking about my queen landing on h4. We know all about this idea when our opponent's pawn is on the f3 square. We're actually going to see some tactics uh, aligning with that idea very soon. Okay, white played the move d5. All right, well, that clarifies the situation in the center. There's no more tension. And now here, I broke one of my own rules. Well, kind of. Chess masters know when it's okay to move the f pawn. We've actually both moved our f pawn. What, have we gone crazy? No, it's not that we've been eating too many Sour Patch Kids. We are trying to break down their opponent's center. In fact, I've got an idea here. Let's just say white plays, oh, I don't know, some kind of regular developing move like bishop to e3, okay? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, and when he takes back, now I'm gonna give queen check. And see, so here's the difference. With those f pawns off the board, now if he plays g3, which is the move he's been wanting to block with, I can play queen takes pawn, because that pawn has no defender. And of course, Mr. Rook down here on h1 is not feeling and very good about his lot in life. Hmm. I guess queen f3 would save white for the moment, but, you know, black is still one upon out of the opening. So, in this position, Sour Hatch needed to defend his pawn, and defend he did. Knight to d2, not bad at all, getting those pieces off the back row. Knight f6, okay, I'm thinking about some of the same tactics here. They don't always work, though. Just because a tactic works in one position may not mean it works in another one. For example, let's just give white some random move. I know a3 doesn't do anything, but I just want to show you the continuation. Now if I take and he takes, obviously my queen can't get to h4, but what I can do is take this pawn. Ow. But does the tactic still work? Actually, no, because after knight takes and queen check, I know it looks like a fork of the king and the knight, but his knight has two different ways to block, probably g3 would be my choice. And, you know, I'm down a piece here. That didn't work out so good. So just because a tactic works in one position doesn't mean you can always make it work in a similar position. So instead, he actually played bishop d3 anyway, overprotecting the pawn. So now there's no chance of that tactic working. Okay, castle. He moved his knight to h3. I guess he had to go somewhere. I would have gone to e2, though, because as you can see, if I ever take pawn takes pawn, then my bishop has a discover attack on his knight, and I could really destroy his pawns. But instead of doing that right away, I played the very mysterious move a5. Now, why would I push the pawn on the side of the board? Well, actually, this is a pretty common idea in this pawn structure. Mr. Knight right here really wants to get to c5. I can get there in two moves. But when I get to c5, I want to make sure he can't play b4 so easily and just kick my knight out of there. So that's the reason for a5. You really have to know your strategic elements of the c5 square in order to understand this move. But I just explained it to you. Okay, he played b4 basically denying my knight access to c5 right away, and I attacked his pawn with my knight. Now, I guess technically he could play pawn takes pawn and win a pawn for the moment, but notice that gives away the c5 square. I hit the bishop, I discover attack the pawn, and all is dreamy in dreamland. So let's go back. Instead, he could also take my knight, but if you do that, you're going to weaken your light squares forever, and uh, I haven't really messed up my position at all after I play rook take, so not going to advise that move. Okay. Instead, after knight to a6, he played a3. And then I got a really funny tactic in mind. I captured, and I was fully expecting him to capture back with the a pawn. After all, that's why he put his pawn on a3, or so I thought. Now, in this position, I was actually going to sacrifice. I was going to play knight takes pawn, discovered attack on his rook. Of course, if he takes my knight... I take his rook, we're back to dreamland, so he's going to instead take my rook, and now I take his bishop with check. Ow. Now, what did I get in exchange for my rook? Well, I got a pawn, I got a bishop, I got a check, he's not going to be able to castle, 
and I got a super strong night. And I was having all kinds of dreamy dream dreams here. For example, if he plays his king to e2, I mean, let's be honest, he doesn't really want to go to the f file where my rook is waiting for him. I was thinking about playing takes, guarding my knight for the moment. And if he takes back, I want this square for my knight. So I was thinking about bishop check, maybe destroying this knight one day, maybe discover attacking his rook, maybe getting my knight to f4, and all I saw was roses and sunshine. Okay, some strange metaphors in this video today. But you can see here, I don't really like his king on any spot. Remember I said of king f1, I would maybe take this and open up the rook's attack on the king? To me, this was worth the one point sacrifice. And you know what? Maybe Sour Hatch saw all of that. Let's go all the way back, because he did not play a takes, instead, he played c takes, but actually, this just gives away a pawn. I can still play knight takes thanks to Mr. Pin on the a file. So I've won a pawn, and unfortunately, this does happen sometimes in kids' chess. When you get surprised by your first tactic of the game, sometimes it kind of clouds our memory. Yeah, the rain clouds form over our head, and we can't think so straight, and we make a series of other bad moves. Now, if this was, let's say, a tournament game, and you had a little bit longer to think, when your opponent surprises you with a move, and it's a really good move, what I used to do sometimes is get up from the board, go splash some water on my face, come back to the board, and kind of treat it like a new game. And you know, if you have time to do that, you could say, okay, I'm down a pawn, my bishop's in danger, let's just save the bishop somewhere, maybe b1 or something, get our bishop on c1 developed to b2, that way our rook is guarded, that way we can take his knight on the next turn and sort of regroup our position. Unfortunately, bishop to b2 happened first, and that allowed basically dominoes to fall. I took this Ow. bishop, forking him, and when the king moved, I took the Oof. other bishop, and suddenly the deficit has gone from one pawn to seven points, 700%. Great if you're playing the stock market, but not so great here if you're white. Aww. Okay, so Sour Hatch attempts to mount a comeback. Does not want to let my knight do a triple jump. Moves the queen to b1. And I could save my knight. My knight could go to a4. But I decided, you know what? It was time to rip open the f file. He took my knight, but after I take on f3, I don't have high hopes for his king surviving. I took here, and when his pawn takes back, of course, the other knight is undefended. So I played the move e4, which basically puts pressure on a soon-to-be pinned piece, and it eyeballs the queen. Hopefully you saw this diagonal from g7 leading down to the queen being opened up. Okay, he tried knight to d2, but now knight takes pawn is a double discovery. Discover check on the king, discover attack on the queen. I don't think we've ever had a double discovery in any of our videos. So the king moved. Of course, I could take the queen right away, but I went for a mate. Queen h4 check. Can always take the queen later. His king moved. I gave another check. I haven't forgotten about the queen. Don't worry. King moves. And now it was finally time to capture the queen. He saved his rook, and we had a nice little checkmate here. I don't think this one has a name. We'll just call it the Fun Master Mike Special. Knight to e3 is mate. So my advice from this game, Get your pieces out a little bit quicker than the pawn, Sour Hatch. And also, when your opponent surprises you with a really good move, that is a good opportunity to take a little bit of extra time and regroup your brain mentally. If you'd done that, you'd only been down one pawn, and the game would have been a long fight. Thanks so much, Sour Hatch, for being such an awesome chess kid and winning our chess kid contest.